Our next, next speaker is Hannah Diega. Uh, she is at the moment uh, at the Basque University in San Sebastian, but was also for a time at Sussex University in the UK. She studies the role of social interaction processes in subjectivity and intersubjectivity, drawing on empirical research from anthropology, linguistics, evolutionary robotics, neuroscience, and various aspects of psychology. Uh, I would like to invite you as the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't have my laptop with me. I feel a little bit handicapped. <laughs> it's over there. I hope it will work. Uh, I think this is the remote control. <laughs> um, so I'm a philosopher of mind and of cognitive science. And um, my presence here, I think, speaks to the goal of the conference and, and uh, conference in psychological science to be integrative and to provide an integrative science of, interest of um, psychology. Uh, I don't see my slide yet. Um, yes. So my main area of study is intersubjectivity or as psychologists call it, social cognition. But I wonder if um, social cognition is, um, as we conceive it as psychologists in a standard way, is encompassing enough to capture all of our social life, whether it's rich and deep enough if we consider social cognition in the um, restricted way I think psychologists often study it. And I will explain this in a moment with this um, video. I this, here I'm going to show a little clip um, from uh, a film by Hitchcock, uh, North by Northwest. Um, and um, for me, I want to illustrate with this clip some of the shortcomings of the psychological science understanding of, so of social, under social cognition. Um, so if you, while you watch this clip, do keep in mind the theory of mind approach, so people figuring out another person using a theory of mind or simulation or something like that. Hot day. Seen worse. Okay, so um, this for me illustrates some of the limitations. I mean, you see here two people, they, and they encounter each other out of the blue in quite a barren context, in, in a barren situation with hardly any context. And the focus is just, uh, or the, the, act, the action is done by the two people themselves alone in a box, if you like, separate from each other trying to figure out what the other person is thinking, and this happens mainly in the head or in the brain. So in a way, you could say there is a gap between these people or a wall between them across which they have to figure out what the other person is intending or feeling or wanting. Um, and this of course, the presupposition behind this is that our, in that our internal, or, or sorry, that our intentions are hidden from other people. And so we have to figure out another person from behavior that we see of them, but that behavior isn't in itself linked to their internal states. We have to infer how it might be linked to internal states in our internal mechanisms. So we don't need to connect with other people on, on this view in order to understand another person. You can do understanding in a, in a standoffish, remote kind of way. And I think that's quite problematic because um, I think that our so intersubjective lives, our social lives, are much more rich and complex than this. And of course, psychologists know this, but somehow the focus has gone to figuring out another person, and if, if this is sort of the pinnacle of how we explain intersubjectivity, we are missing a rich ground of what we do in our social lives. So what I'm interested in is looking at the intricate, um, multi-layered complexity of daily life intersubjectivity. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, um, well, 
I, I'm going to give just three examples of research that shows uh, all the different aspects or, or several of the different aspects that are involved in our social lives and how they connect to each other. And we already saw some uh, here in the conference yesterday and on Thursday. Um, for instance, this example, uh, it's a, um, I want to refer with this picture to the, effect, to the fact that socioeconomic status has an effect on brain development and on psychological well-being. So you have here the influence of society, of economics, on brain development, on psychological well-being, on interactions within families. These are, it's a very wide range of aspects that are involved in intersubjectivity. That's one example. Another example is that people can coordinate with each other subconsciously or unconsciously in many different ways. Yesterday we have seen some research um, by Wolfgang Schacher, who is here, um, about how patients and therapists synchronize in their movements with each other and how this influences or has an effect on or is connected to how the, the outcome of the therapy and how patient and therapist relate. But also, people can coordinate their heartbeats in different situations. Also in therapy situations, for instance, but this is an example of um, relatives of someone doing a firewalking ri ritual, looking at them in the audience, their heartbeat coordinates with that of the person doing the firewalking, but not the heartbeat of p other people in the audience who are not connected to the firewalker. Another example is that when you expect to lift something together with another person, the load looks lighter. So here's an example of um, an expectation in the social realm having an influence on object perception. And there are many other examples of this. So if intersubjectivity is like that, I'm sorry, my slides don't appear here, so I have to look up, I'm sorry about that. Um, how can we investigate this rich, um, multi-layered complexity of intersubjectivity? Is there a way to cross the disciplinary borders? Is, can we capture this, com this rich complexity in, in an integrative way? Um, I think we can, and I, I've been developing a conceptual framework to do this, to try to do this. And this is my work as a philosopher. I will, when I, when I explain this, I will explain it in different levels. So I will explain um, what is participatory sense making, that is how we call the conceptual framework, but also how we understand intersubjectivity in this way, as participatory sense making. Um, and I will explain sort of what happens at a level between people, but I will also explain uh, at what level I do this work. Um, but this will become clearer towards the end of the presentation. Um, so this work started in 2007, more or less, uh, with the coming out of this paper. I've been work I had been working on it a long time before, of course, but this is the first paper that appeared on it. I wrote it together with Ezekiel Di Paolo, um, and it appeared in Phenomenology and the Cognitive Sciences. So what, what do we propo propose here? Or in other words, ah, there they are, good, thank you. What is participatory sense-making? So participatory sense-making is basically uh, researching intersubjectivity based on two main pillars. The first one is the definition and operationalization of the role of the interaction process or the in-between, between what happens between people when they interact or encounter each other. Um, and this is a novel proposal because usually we look, we are used to looking at individuals processing something in front of them. But if we start looking at the interaction process as such and how it works, um, then you get a different view on intersubjectivity and you also get a different view on the subjects that are partaking in intersubjective or social situations. So the two pillars of this approach are, on the one hand, the interaction process studied as such, and I will explain this in a moment a bit more, and the conception of the subjects that get involved in these interactions, which changes if you take an intersubject or an interactive perspective. And this is not just theoretical work. Um, of course, there is a lot of su support from current uh, re new research tools, um, not so new, maybe all of them. Dynamical systems theory has been around for a while, but it's very handy to study this, um, th this phenomenon. But other examples of, of um, interesting tools include uh, dual scanning neuroscience and, and other uh, ones. Um, so in order to look at so these two pillars, I will explain them now. Firstly, I would like to focus on the individual involved in social situations. 
and we understand the individual as a sense maker. Uh, so an action, the inactive theory of cognition, and this is mainly um, um, comes mainly from the work of Francisco, Francisco Varela and Evan Thompson and Ezekiel Di Paolo, um, because there are different um, uses of the word in action, but this is the one that I'm referring to here. And the references will appear in a moment as well. So in action defines cognition as sense making, and I will explain this a few times in different words. So it means that it um, looks at cognizers as autonomous systems, as autonomous beings who self-organize and therefore have to maintain an identity. It's also based on a non-trivial notion of embodiment, which I will explain in a moment as well. It's also a lot based on experience. In an action, we consider experience to be a central aspect of what goes on in cognizers or sense makers, and we also consider it a tool for doing the research. But I won't be talking about this now, but there are, there's work on that as well. And emergence also is an important notion. So we define sense-making as the relational process of signification between an autonomous self-organizing agent and his world. A sense-maker is always, ha because it is a self-organizing system, always has a perspective on this world. And um, this is because the self-organization entails certain needs and constraints. And this is where meaning comes from on this approach. So it's not a matter of um, having a box for meaning in the brain and connecting different um, functionalities to it. Here, meaning comes from how an agent or a cognizer or a living system, which is the most uh, well-known example of such a system, how such an, um, a creature f has meaning in its world based on the needs as a self-organizing system. And this happens, uh, happens at different levels of identity. So we have the metabolic level of identity. You know, we need food and we need uh, to excrete some uh, waste project products. This is a, a, a level of self-maintenance, but there we have many different other ones as well. And especially as humans, of course, we have quite high level um, self-maintenance things that we have to do, like giving a talk in front of psychologists. As a philosopher, I have to do certain things in order to maintain my identity. So this just to illustrate that there are different levels of identity. Um, this schematic, um, I, I don't know if, is there a pointer here? No. Um, anyway, the, the big circle, the, the one that is this in this way, um, um, is, is, a kind of, is a representation of the self-organization or self-maintenance, the most basic one, maybe the biological or metabolic one. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, and here is another circle. Um, this is another level of identity. It might be the immu immune system self-maintaining or the sensory motor system or the neurological system self-maintaining. So this, just to indicate again that there are different levels of self-maintenance. And then such a system interacts with, it, uh, with its environment. And this is a drawing that comes from a book by Fr Maturana and Varela, The Tree of Knowledge. But, um, and this is uh, what I'm going to say now, is, is really quite a long um, technical argumentation, but on its own, this kind of view, this autopoietic view of, of sense-makers isn't enough, but because in a way, autopoiesis is an on or off situation. Either you are autopoietic and you self-maintain, or you don't, and then you're dead. And there's nothing in between. So we cannot really come to the idea of sense-making just from this. And therefore, Ezekiel Di Paolo made in 2005 in a paper a suggestion that it is because of this self-organization and because of the norms uh, that it generates for what is relevant for a system or what is good for it or what is bad for it, for its self-organization. Based on that, it can modulate the, in the interaction that it has with the environment, and this is what a sense maker is. So it is having a perspective based on your self-organization and being able to regulate your interactions with the environment based on this. So. Another way to illustrate this is a story about this insect, which is a water boatsman. This is a picture of it underwater. Um, and insects have lungs, so they normally cannot breathe underwater. But I think, I, I'm, I don't remember quite well, but I think this insect need, needs to be underwater to get its food. And what it does um, is it, it cannot stay underwater, so it needs to f have a way to breathe for a longer time than it normally could do. So what it does is it, tra it traps um, air bubbles in, in the little hairs that it has on its body. And from that, it sucks oxygen. 
but because of the difference in the air pressure in the water and in the air bubbles, the air bubbles don't collapse for a while. They stay open and oxygen can flow into them and through them into the body of the insect and act as a kind of extended lung in that way. So this is a way in which a living system can adapt its self-organization to different circumstances and uh, have a different kind of interaction with the environment that maintains its identity for longer in the ways that, in the ways that are needed for it specifically. For this insect, it's in this way, but for different identities and different creatures, we do it in different ways. So we have a adaptation to precarious circumstances. So here is another way to represent the self-organization and the fact that it is not always perfect, it's actually a precarious system and this is really important. The precari precariousness of it is make, makes uh, that things are meaningful for us because because of this precariousness we have to regulate what comes in and what goes out and we may have to adjust and repair the self-organization that we are doing in different circumstances. So. Self-organization of living systems, and living systems are the ultimate examples of, this kinds of, of these kinds of uh, self-organizers and sense makers, is always a precarious process. Um, and the self-organization and precariousness make that situations, events and processes are significant for a sense maker or for a cognitive agent. And that is why in an action we call um, cognizers sense makers. Uh, so the crucial or basic question in an action, if you do an active research, is always why does something mean something for someone? Why does this creature do this at this moment? It must be meaningful for it because of its need to self-maintain. Or another way to put it is what is at, at stake for this sense maker? And so, the, oops, sorry. Um, the, um, the issue is always about connecting behavior and self-organization or existence. And I put existence here um, for a reason. It's again to, in, to, to um, illustrate the different levels and the different uh, aspects of intersubjectivity and of subjectivity, because existence can refer to the very basic uh, maintenance of our, of our biological being, our metabolic being. But at the same time, as humans, we also know that many things matter to us existentially, and this is we always comprehend it as something very high level, and it is that, and we have those experiences, and those are very relevant too to how we organize ourselves in, the, in our lives. Um, and so all these levels are present in this uh, approach. So in order to continue with what is participatory sense-making, we have looked at what an individual is in this situation, and this was one of the pillars of the approach. Um, now let's look at the interaction process. So the interaction process, we have defined it as an autonomous um, process itself as well. That means a process that can self-maintain, and I will illustrate this in a moment. And in a way, we can say then that interactions can take a life uh, of their own. They can take on a life of their own. And for this, I would like to um, take you to the cinema again for just a few moments. Here's the definition that we proposed, but rather than have you read the definition completely, I will illustrate it with this film clip and then also repeat the point of it. So watch what happens here. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My fault. This is a situation that we call the, the narrow corridor situation, which we think is paradigmatic for the fact that interaction processes can take on a life of their own. And we've all experienced this, of course. You, walk into, you want to walk to your office, but a colleague comes by, or some, even someone that you don't know, and it's a narrow corridor. You step to one side, and the person steps to, the one si to, to that side at the same time. You step to the other side because you want to let them pass, and they step to the, at the same time. So here, an interaction emerges, and it keeps existing for a little while against your intentions. So this illustrates for us this, this um, existence of interaction processes as autonomous for a while. And, and the fact that they can influence individual intentions and override individual intentions. So this phenomenon can be studied and it has been done of course in um, sociology for a long time, in conversation analysis and, and uh, other fields like that. So there's a long history of studying these kinds of processes. 
And of course, now with the new methods in neuroscience and using dynamical systems tools, we can study them extensively as well. So it's not that this is an ephemeral phenomenon, it's studyable, it's, it's measurable. Um, so in order to make the point again, interaction process can be made of these patterns of coordination and breakdown. So it's not only about coordinating well, but actually what happens when it breaks down is very important as well. Because in a way, if a good interaction coordination process breaks down, then a space opens up for trying to make new meaning with another person. So these patterns of coordination and breakdown are good candidates for the mechanisms that can supplement or even replace individual cognitive function. Um, and the complexity of interaction can be measured with dynamical system systems tools. And these patterns of coordination can modulate, enable, and constrain individual sense-making processes. And if you want to know more about this, um, in our paper that I reference here, we make this argument in, a, in an extensive way. Um, next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and again. I'm sorry. So there are two, two conditions for calling an interaction social on this view. Firstly, there, there has to be a co-regulated mutual coupling that leads to a temporary operational closure or autonomy of the interaction process, as I've just illustrated. And secondly, the autonomy of the interaction interactors as sense makers or as autonomous self-organizing beings, beings also shouldn't be destroyed in the process. So it can be increased or decreased. So my autonomy here is slightly decreased when I have to ask the technical people to help me do these slides. So the, the, you can see the autonomy can be decreased in this way or it can be increased by what, what a particularly nice social interaction provides for you. If someone welcomes you to a, as a conference like this and is happy that you're here, then your autonomy is kind of increased. So, but it shouldn't be destroyed, because if the autonomy of one of the interactors is destroyed in this process of interacting with them, or by, one, by another interactor, then it's not a social situation anymore. So in a way, also with this definition, we wanted to um, find out what the limits are of social situations. So both of these conditions have to hold. Um, so if we have all sense makers participating in an interaction and we have defined them as this self-organizing system uh, regulating their interactions with, in a, with the environment in particular ways based on their needs as self-organizing systems, then when they encounter another one, um, like this, <laughs> then um, another self-organizing system emerges between them, which is the interaction process, and it can be, can be in itself also precarious and would sometimes need the help of the participants also for maintaining itself. Then we have intersubjectivity understood as the interplay between interactive and individual autonomy and sense-making. And this is participatory sense-making. So this is in a nutshell, what the theory is. And I apologize to people who may already be familiar with the work. This talk is very introductory, but I thought that was what I could do in a short time like this. Um, then another thing, this is the final thing I would like to explain. So this is about kind of the level at which I think this work happens, what the, the, the level of theorizing that I'm doing here. And then also after this slide, I will come back, I will come to the last one in which I come back to the question of um, um, the integrative framework for studying intersubjectivity. So the work that I'm doing, so imagine that participatory sense-making is a tree. Um, the work I'm doing happens at the stem of the tree, mostly, which means the, the development of the core concepts of the theory. And I don't do this alone, I do this with several collaborators, who I would like to thank also in this way, um, who are in different places in the world as well. Um, so that work happens there. Of course, we have many shoulders that we stand on. It's not a new theory, obviously. These ideas are, are known in different fields as well, but we bring them together in this way, in a novel way, I think. Um, but some, these are some of our influences and, and affiliated ideas uh, in history, but also today. Um, and so now, in order to make it um, th this, I'm a philosopher, but I'm not interested in doing armchair philosophy. I think it's really important to do, to apply this theory, to, to connect with different disciplines, to connect with 
sectors in society where people are dealing with this every day, so for, un for instance, teachers or artists or um, therapists. Um, and this is what I would like to talk about a little bit now. So that's actually the branches and the leaves of the tree um, where the concepts get hypothesized increasingly finely and then investigated by people from different fields. And then the, um, the results of these hypotheses feed back into the theory as well. So now let's look at this for a moment. Let's take a top view on the tree. And then it looks like this. So here you have the, the stem of the tree where the theory development is happening and the concepts are being developed. Then um, the um, different concepts are, de are developed in different, different ways, in increasingly uh, measurable ways, me increasingly fine hypotheses for um, uh, sociology, for psychiatry and psycho psycho psychopathology. In philosophy as well, there's a lot of work developing different aspects of it in terms of ethics, for instance, or in terms of the concept of the self. Uh, in psychology, in linguistics, and in neuroscience, and I will just illustrate uh, three of those. I'm sorry that this slide isn't very um, sharp. Um, and I have developed some of these concepts in the, in the area of autism, and then um, this leads to new, theory, new, new uh, hypotheses for uh, autism, for, and uh, especially for the embodiment and sense-making and participatory sense-making of people with autism, but I, I can't really go into detail here. Um, in psychology, there is, for instance, work by Laura Galbucera, who investigates uh, why psychotherapy works, and she relates it also to, to Wolfgang Schacher's work, um, and his work is also um, related to that. She um, investigates why psychotherapy works using these concepts, both on the terms on, on the in the area of how patient and therapist or client and therapist coordinate in inter in their interactions together, and also the experience of these interactions. Uh, and she tries to explain why therapy works in that way. Uh, in the area of neuroscience, we have proposed an interactive brain hypothesis, uh, where we connect uh, these ideas to neuroscience. Um, and I, I agree very much with what Professor Han said about how uh, genetics and society and cultural influences and our interactions influence how the brain uh, is shaped and how the brain works. And our hypothesis here is that um, social skills, interactive skills, are what build our individual capacities that we use later in life um, in interactions. Um, Anyway, look at the paper if you're interested in that part of the work. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.